Okay, you all ready tonight? Got your pen and paper out. Got your ears tuned up. Young people, I want you to, to behave tonight. Amen. Ought not to be leaving the service while they're preaching going on. I say that all the time while I'm preaching, but that goes doubly so during evangelistic meetings. Uh, parents, I hope you try to control your kids tonight. Amen. Try to keep them close to you. We want the Lord to work on our service tonight. Amen. Brother Domley's prepared hard. He's prayed for this time that we're going to have just about a half hour, 45 minutes. And uh, that'll, that'll be it. So I, I pray that you give him your undivided attention tonight. Brother Domley's a great man. He, he really is. I'm having a lot of, a lot of uh, great times with him, visiting in our homes, and an opportunity to go out soul winning. And uh, he's from uh, First Baptist Church, Hammond, uh, Indiana. Some of you know that. Dr. Jack Howes is a pastor there. Been in evangelism six years. And, boy, I don't know what he's going to be like in six more years. I don't know if he's going to have that stamina. He's got a lot of stamina. Okay, you watch out tonight. I told him he was a little cold when we came into the building tonight. I said, you may have to run up and down the pews tonight. You may have to jump some pews tonight. You may have to circle the crowd tonight to get them heated up. Amen. So I don't know what to expect. I'm just like you. But one thing I, I, I do want to see tonight, I want to see God work. Amen. And I trust you'll give him your undivided attention. Let's give him a big hand as he comes and preaches tonight. Brother Dominic. Well, last night they didn't have me wired up. Tonight I'm wired up. Hey, man, I got my microphone tonight, so you're in trouble tonight. Hey, man, I, I, I'm not sure if I like these wireless mics or not because what happens is the PA man, he always turns me down. And so if he turns me down, tonight, I know who he is. I want to shoot him. And... Um, my wife, she knows what I, I have to preach every night. And so these PA men, they say, well, he's loud, so I better turn him down. So then I get quieter, and then they turn me back up. And then I, and then I start getting louder, and then they turn me back down. And so I go home, and I have a fit. And so my wife gets the bad end of the deal. So you're in trouble tonight. If you get, if I get, my, if you get my wife bad, you're in, you're in serious trouble tonight. And um, you don't want to get my wife mad, amen? And no, she's not, she's not that bad, really. She's not. She's worse than that. So you're in trouble. <laughs> So, but I, I'm glad that you're here tonight. It's good. Amen. It's better. It sounds like it's better being here than it is outside right now. You heard that water. This, this kind of reminds me of down south. Of course, anything down south is good. A whole lot better than the north. Amen. My wife and I were talking about that just a few minutes ago. She goes, when you said, when you said the song, you had that southern draw again, you know. And I said, that sounds, she goes, I, that sounds so good. She goes, no, it sounds like a southerner. And so she's a, yes, she's a Yankee. That's okay. I think God can sa save Yankees. I'm not sure. I'm working on her, but um, but we're, we'll see about it. You know, God God always talks about the South all the time in the Bible. Amen. And of course, in the do what? That's right. That's exactly right from the South. Amen. But anyway, I'm glad you. Let me ask you this question: How many went so winning today? If you went out so winning today. Raise your hand. Okay. Let's see who all went out so winning today. Okay. We got one, two, three. Um, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Eleven went out soul winning today. That's good. Now, if you saw someone saved today, let me see. Did anybody, any of those that went out soul winning, did you lead someone to Christ? Anybody like that? Okay. Anybody like that? Okay. Brother Lynn and I, we, we were out soul winning. We was able to lead someone to Christ. They're going to be here on Wednesday night. Amen. That's good. I'm excited about that. I know someone else in here is probably pretty excited about it because they're going to have them for a guest. I told them I'd give it to that person on, on, on Wednesday night. So they're... They know who they know who I'm talking about, and so they're kind of excited about that, I'm sure. And um, I'm glad that you're here tonight. Well, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 13. Genesis, chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Genesis, chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Let's all stand as we read the Word of God. Genesis, chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Let me say this before I read the scripture. Now, don't let the rain stop you this week. Satan would do anything he can to stop you from going out soul winning this week. And I mean that. He will. Son, it, it wasn't so. It, he, you went out soul winning today, son. You, you, you got character, eh? man. That's all I can say. Um, it, it takes. It, I, I was proud of those who went out soul winning today. I, I mean, just to go out in the rain. I told, I told Brother Dave, I said, my hair got messed up. He goes, yeah, mine would have too, but not much. Amen? That's what he said. And so, of course, if Brother Allen would have went out, nothing would have got messed up. So, but that's okay. I just, I just know. You, you say, man, don't find Who do I? I know I'm not. I, but I still got a covering a little bit. Amen? My wife, I, my wife is so kind to me. I was up preaching one day, and, 
And as I think it's in Cheyenne, Wyoming, after the service, she comes up and she notices the weirdest things while I'm preaching. <laughs> One time I was preaching, she said, I look like Jack in the box behind the pulpit. And so, <laughs> and so I don't know what to expect tonight when I go home, amen. You wonder why I'm grumpy when I get behind the pulpit every night. But one night I, I, came, I came home, she goes, she goes, Alan, when you was preaching, she goes, I looked at your head, and she goes, you're really going bold. I said, thank you, honey. You're so kind to me. And, um, but, you know, I guess, I guess the Lord found a way to keep me humble, amen. I just got married, and now I've got to stay humble, amen. She, she, makes sure, she does make sure that, I promise that. But um, so, no, no, no more, you can't tell me I'm bold. My wife will tell me all that stuff tonight when I get home. And so you don't have to worry about that. I, I pick on you, and then she picks on me when I get home. So that's why I come back. i got to do it on somebody. i, I got to keep peace at the home, amen? And so I just let her pick on me, and then I'll come out here and pick on you, because you can't do a thing, because I'm up here, amen? I, that's what I like about it. I had one guy, I had one guy, I, one guy, he started talking to me while I was, while I was, before I was preaching. He kind of challenged me. I said, son, I said, yeah. I said, this is the worst time in the world to even do this. I said, I'm going to preach in a few minutes. He goes, that's okay. I said, you don't understand who I am. And my wife knows I always try finding somebody in the auditorium. The other night, Brother, Brother Dan thought he was wise. Of course, that'd be, that'd be new for him. But, <laughs> but anyway, the other night, he thought he'd, tease me, he thought he'd tease me a little bit. I told him, I said, it's a long week, amen? And, and I know he does, not want to get in, he does not want to get started with me. And so, but we, we were at his house tonight. And um, his wife cooked a good, some good food. She was a great host. He was a terrible host, but she was a great host. And so, but I'm glad that you're here tonight. And let's do our best to invite some people out again tomorrow night. Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, it says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with, it, went, or, and lot with him into where? The south. Amen. Isn't that great? We were talking about the south already. God's already beginning to bless it says, And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. I want to preach to you tonight on a very simple subject. You've probably heard this title before. I didn't get it from anybody. I probably got it from your pastor, and he probably got it from someone else. But anyway... I'm just going to preach tonight on a very simple subject, on going back to Bethel. Going back to Bethel. Bethel simply means the house of God. That's all it means. It means the house of God. And I want to preach to you tonight on that subject. Heavenly Father, I long to help thy people tonight. I look in front of me, a good group of people out for a Monday night, excellent crowd. And yet, Father, they could have stayed home. They could have looked at the weather and said, well, it's raining out. We'll just stay home instead of going to church. But I'm glad that they're faithful enough to come out on a Monday night to hear someone stand up and preach a message to them. Because, Father, I believe they want their lives to be changed. Now, I pray, Holy Spirit, how I need thy power. Oh, God, tonight, work in a mighty way. Change us tonight. Show us some things that we really just don't want to see, but we need to see. I pray that you'd pulverize our hearts tonight. Sprinkle some salt upon it. And God, just bring us back to thee. Purify our lives tonight, I pray, Holy Spirit. And when the invitation's given, I pray that those who you speak to their hearts tonight, may they move as you've spoken to them in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God says to Abram, Abram, I want you to leave this land that you're living in now. And I want you to go to a place that I want to make of you a great nation. He says, he says, I want to make, he says, I want to make your name, I want to multiply your seed like the sand of the seas. And so Abram began to pack up his bags, put his house up for sale. And I'm sure the neighbors began to come by and said, um, Abram, why, uh, where are you moving to? You going to move across town? No, I'm, I'm moving out of town. Where are you going to? You going, what, 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 what state you going to? He said, well, I, I'll be honest with you, I really don't know where I'm going. What do you mean you don't know where you're going? Well, you see, God told me last night that, I, that He wants me to move. So I'm selling everything that I've got, and I'm going over to some land. I don't know where I'm going, but I know God told me to go there. So I figure if God told me to go there, I figure I just ought to go, because God knows what's best. And so he began to pack up his bags, 
And he had a lot of faith in order to do that. I mean, it'd be like your pastor coming up tonight and just saying, well, people, I'm, I'm selling my house and God's telling me to move. And I know his wife, what his wife would say if he did that. He says, we're just going to move. She, she'd go, where are we going to go, honey? He goes, I don't know. We're just going to go until God tells us to stop. She'd probably tell him, you can go and then call me up when you get there. Amen. That's probably what she would do. But I mean, that's, that's about what Abram had to do. I mean, Abram, his wife didn't know. His wife, all she knows, all she knew is that he was a man of God, that she, that he had faith in God. And so she, she followed him and she did exactly what he said that he was going to do. He left, he went to a place, and he finally got to this place, this place called Bethel. He got to Bethel and the Bible says he set up his altar there at Bethel. And he worshiped God because that was the place God wanted to make of him a great nation. He began to he began to worship God there in that place, and you can imagine as he was in that place how exciting it was for him to be there. You know how it is when you move to a new place. You come to a new place, everything's fun, everything's exciting, everything's new. You don't know all the bugs, you know. You don't you don't see all the warts around about the place. You don't know all the bad things. You don't know all the idiosyncrasies about each other or anything like that. Everybody seems to be good. I mean, you can even like Brother Dan when you first move here. You know what I'm talking about. And, and, and I knew I'd get an amen. Out of you. That's the first time I got an amen out of him all week long. But anyway, so, you be very careful, amen. And so, so anyway, here, here we are. We're in a brand new place. And boy, it seems exciting. Everything is fun. I mean, boy, the God is meeting with us. And boy, the preaching's good. I mean, boy, it's exciting. But now, Abram has been there for a while. You know how it is after you get there for a while? You start hanging around Brother Dan and boy, times get rough. And you, you, I mean, it's getting rough as you hang around there, you know. I don't know why you did that on Saturday night, but you just, you asked for it. It's going to be a very long week. I, I do take peace offerings, chocolate chip cookies, Reese's peanut butter cups, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, and so, so he's been there now at Bethel for a while and times begin to get a little bit rough. I mean, times are getting now to where, you know, it's just not as exciting as it used to be. He still does the same things. He still does what's right. But it's just not as exciting now as it used to be. And so now he begins to look at Bethel and say, Boy, this is kind of labor to kind of stay here now. He had a young man with him by the name of Lot. Lot was his nephew, and Lot, w- Lot was serving God at the time. But there was a famine in the land where he was. And as there was a famine there... He began to look around, and he looked down towards Egypt and found, and he heard that Egypt was having, was, wasn't having a famine, so this is what Abram decided. He decided what he would do is he'd move down to Egypt and just sojourn in Egypt for a little time. When the famine's all over, he'd move back, is what he decided to do. So he packed up his bags, and he moved down to Egypt. And, you, and by the way, Egypt always looks better than Bethel, always. But may I say, Egypt's results are not better than Bethel's results. You can you say, well, it's Egypt. Egypt's the world. The world always looks fun for a while. And by the way, it is fun for a while. But when the season is over, you must reap what you've sown. It's a Bible principle. He now, he goes, he, he goes down to Egypt and he brings that young man by the name of Lot. He gets down there to the land of Egypt or down, down to the land of Egypt. And, and as he's down there, that young man Lot, he, he begins to see things he's never seen before. He's never seen the flashing lights of Egypt before. He's never seen the dance halls of Egypt before. He's never heard the rock music of Egypt before. He's never seen all the, uh, he's never seen the, the, the men and the women, um, um, you know, going swimming together before. Now, he's got a new place and son. I mean, boy, it looks fun down there. He sees all these flashing lights. Everybody's going to all these casinos, you know, buying all the lottery tickets. I'm just going to get it all in before I start preaching. Amen. I just got to get it somewhere. And so he, he sees all of a sudden, said, boy, this is exciting, boy, this is fun. They don't have this back at Bethel. And so Lot begins to experience a little bit of Egypt, and he begins to say, boy, Egypt sure is fun. Abram now, realizing his mistake, Abram decides, well, I better get back to Bethel, because I'm not right with God, God's not blessing me here, I think I better go back to where God met with me at the beginning. So he packs up his bags. He says, Lot, we're going back to Bethel. He packs up his bags. He goes back to Bethel. He gets right with God. He sets up that altar, sacrifices to God, and now everything is right with God with him. But we find the very next phrase is this, that Lot and his herdsmen could not get on with Abram and his herdsmen. We find out all of a sudden Lot comes to Abram and says, Abram, this land can't contain us anymore. 
Our, our herdsmen are, are striving together. We just can't get along like we used to. And you know, the land, I think, it, I think the land is just a little bit too small. And I think, Abram, I think I need to move. Now hold on a second, Lot. Didn't it, didn't this land used to contain you before? Couldn't you live together before? How come you can't live together now? I tell you why. Cause now Lot has been exposed to Egypt. And now Lot looks down not far from where he lives now. He sees a place called Sodom. Sodom kinda reminds him of Egypt. Sodom kinda looks like Egypt. Sodom has all the excitement that Egypt has. Sodom has all the flashing lights that Egypt has. Sodom looks exciting, looks fun. And boy, he says, boy, I think I'd like to move back down there. And so he says, he's telling his uncle Abram says, Uncle Abram, I'm just going to move right down there towards Sodom. I'm not going to go inside the city. I'm just going to move right down there and just live outside the city, you know, because we just can't get along. And by the way, that's the first step of compromise. Thinking that you can get outside the world and not be in the world, you better beware of yourself, son, because you don't go outside the world and dabble with the world and the world not get you. It always gets you. Lot goes down to Sodom. He moves outside of Sodom. We know the story. Lot there lives a wicked life. God decides to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. Abram begins to pray to God and says, God, please don't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, and, and Abram says, God, if you can find ten righteous people, would you not destroy the land of Sodom and Gomorrah? God says, if I can find ten righteous people, I promise you, I won't destroy the land. Abram went through the whole city of Sodom and Gomorrah, couldn't find ten righteous people. Can you imagine this? Here's a Christian man, lives down there in Sodom and Gomorrah all these years, and could not lead ten people to Christ in all these years. Now God comes to destroy the city, sends his two angels there. They come knocking on, on Lot's door. Lot opens the door. He sees that they're, that they're the angels of God. He invites them in. The men of the city, we know that story. The men of the city come. They want to know. They want to know these angels. He says, no. He says, I've got two daughters that haven't known any men. Why don't you come in and, and have them? They said, no, we want, the, we want those angels over there. They're men. We want to, we want to, we want to know them. And be, and the men of the city were so wicked, they began to press upon Lot. The angels smote those men with blindness. And, and he's, and, he, and the angels said to Lot, Lot, you get your family up. We're getting out of here. Lot goes to his son-in-laws of his other two daughters and says to his son-in-laws, guys, God's going to destroy the city. We've got to move out of here. And they look at Lot and say, Lot, you getting religion or what? We never heard you talk about God before. You haven't lived like, you haven't lived like God for, for you. I know your, your daughter said you used to go to church, but you haven't been in church in a long time. What is this talking about God? God's not going to destroy the city. Lot, you can leave, but we're staying. Me and my wives are staying here. You can leave if you want to, but we're staying. Lot lost his two daughters in Sodom and Gomorrah. He had other two daughters that he brought with him and his wife, and they left Sodom and Gomorrah. As they leave, his wife was so kin to the world. As she turned back, God turned her into a pillar of salt because God said, Don't you look back. They go up to this mountain and they get alone. It's just Lot now and his two daughters. His two daughters said, they say, they talk to each other and they begin to, they begin to say, well, hey, we've got to do something. Dad doesn't have anybody to bring up a name to him and we've got to bring up his name. They said, oh, we'll know what we'll do. We'll, we'll get him drunk and one night I'll go into him and he can get me pregnant. Next night you get him drunk and then he, you can go into him and he'll get you pregnant. And that's exactly what happened. Those two daughters were pregnant by their own father, committed that great sin of incest and all of this happens. Why? Because, is it Lot's fault? Sure it is. But hold on a second. It was also Abram's fault for exposing Lot to, to Egypt. That's Abram's fault. Lot would have never gone down to Sodom and Gomorrah had he never seen Egypt. Lot would have never gone down to Sodom and Gomorrah if he never saw, saw the excitements of Egypt. But because Bethel got bored and got stale to Abram, he went down to Egypt and realized that he shouldn't belong to Egypt, but he exposed someone to Egypt. And because of that, he destroyed a young man and, and that young man's wife and their daughters. And, and my, he destroyed them. Why? Because he got stale at Bethel. Follow me. All across America, that happens. You say, what are you talking about? Let me illustrate. There used to be a time that you enjoyed going to church. There used to be a time you said, boy, a revival meeting. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, do I ever like revival meetings. Man, I love a revival meeting. 
Boy, this is fun. I love going to church. Let that evangelist come in there and just jump all over my toes. I love it. You used to love going to Bible meetings where you go to church and you say, man, I just can't get enough for church. I can't wait to get to church. You come to church, sit there in the edge of your seat. Some of you get up with the southern draw. He say, turn, turn your song books to page 241. You all turn to page 241. Everybody starts singing the song. And boy, you were, you were sitting there in that song book just singing as loud as you could. Couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But some of you sing it anyway because you enjoyed singing. Amen. You just say, why? You enjoyed church. It was fun. It is. Boy, it's exciting. The preacher stood up to preach. He said, well, I wonder what he's going to preach today. Man, I can't wait. He stood up and preached. You'd sit there. You'd shout him in a while. You'd wave your hanky a while. Because that's what they do down south. I know up here in the north, you don't know. But I mean, down south, what they do. They just wave their hanky a while. They get so good. Isn't that right, brother? He knows. Hey, I mean, man. Hey, I mean, boy, it's fun. It's good. Why? Because it's new to you. It's exciting. You enjoyed church back then. You enjoyed the songs. You enjoyed singing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved the rest like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And you began to sing that song and tears would roll down your face. You said, boy, I love these songs. This reminds me of what I used to be. But look at where I'm going. You enjoy church. It was fun. Amen. There used to be a time you, enjoy, you, you couldn't wait to pray. You enjoyed praying. There was a time, you, every morning you wake up, you wake up early. Sleeping in just didn't enthuse you back then. You just got saved and you enjoyed talking to the Lord. You would get on your knees before God and begin to pray and say, Oh God, this is another day, I've got to talk to you. Man, I couldn't wait for this time. And you'd spend time in your faith before God. You'd begin to pray, and it was like the, like the doors of heaven were open, like a direct line between you and the Father as you would talk to Him. you say, Now, Father, I've got to go to work today. I want you to know I'll be back here right after work. You go to work, and you go to work, and, and you work all day long. During, during lunchtime, you get your Bible out, read your Bible a little bit. Then you pray a little bit. You go back to work after lunch. You go and work all the rest of the afternoon. You come back home. Say, boy, this is the time I can't wait for. This is the time I get to talk to the Lord again. You get down on your knees after you got home from work. You say, God, let me tell you what happened today. Let me tell you what happened on the job today. I know you already know, but I just love talking to you. Why? Because you love to pray. You love to talk to the Lord. You love to spend time with God. All was exciting to you. Amen. There was a time that God's Word was exciting to you. There was a time that you would look at God's Word and as you'd read God's Word, it was like the words would jump out at you. You'd get that Bible and you'd read it and read it and read it and read it and read it. It wasn't just one chapter or three chapters just so you can get through the Bible in one year. No, sir. you read and read and read till you couldn't till you about ready to fall asleep or till you had to go to do something else. Your wife would begin to ask you, can't you ever stop reading that book and just come over and talk to me in a while? Oh, you loved it. Amen. You studied that Bible. You got in that Bible. You began to study it because you loved the truths that you found in that Bible. You loved the truth. You loved the, this is how God would speak to your heart. You would get that Bible. Not only would you study it, but you'd also memorize it. Amen. You get that Bible. You say, boy, the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart. But I'm not sitting against thee. You realize, boy, the best thing I can do is memorize this Bible. And so you would get scriptures, of, you get portions of the Bible. You begin to memorize it each week and each month. And boy, it was exciting to you. Why? It was new. Remember, I don't know how it was like when I was young. We used to go to school. I went to a Christian school. We were required to memorize passages of scripture every month. But after you graduate, you're not required anymore. After you graduate, if you're going to memorize scripture, it's going to take a little bit of character. About a year ago, I was in the Philippines, preaching over there. I, know, I was there, and I can't remember what day it was. I was, I, went, I was down in the southern part in the Iloilo area. How, and, the, and I was going to be going back to this one jungle church back there, and I was supposed to preach there a few times in that one church that day. And so in order to get back to this church, we'd take the jeepney to this one road, and they'd drop us off to this one road, then we'd get up this motorcycle. 
on this motorcycle, no sidecars. What we do is we get on this motorcycle, me with my, I have my bag over here, with all my clothes, I have my camera's bag over here, I have my jug of water in this hand, my interpreter was behind me with his bag, and then there was us two on the motorcycle, and the driver was on the motorcycle, plus three other people on this one motorcycle. You say, you got to be lying. No, sir, I'm not lying. I'm telling the honest truth. We get on that motorcycle. We start going back there. I mean, I've never prayed like I have in my life, you know. I mean, I've never seen six people on one dumb motorcycle. Here we are on this motorcycle, packed on there. He said, how'd you get on? How'd you get off? I don't know, sir. I had my eyes closed. We're going down the road, this muddy road. We're just driving down the road, six people on this motorcycle. We get way back there. I mean, way back there. We, he finally, he stopped and says, that's where you want to go. I looked at that building. We got off and went. And the preacher said, Brother Domley, service, we start in a few minutes. I went to the little back room, what they call rooms. I went into the little back room. I changed my clothes. I went out and I preached that morning. That afternoon, he said, we had to, we had to, we had to sing a little bit. But before I got to preach, he said, Brother Domley, I want to honor those who, have, who we have, we've had a contest in the past six months. And he says in the contest, it's been Bible memorization, and he says, I want to honor them for what they've done. He says their first place award is this little Bible. He pulled out one of those little Bibles, a Bible kind of like, and let me see this Bible right here, a Bible just like this right here. You know, in the United States, we wouldn't do much for a Bible like this. But over there, they do quite a bit because they just like the Bible. Amen. And so here we are. We, we would have, oh, sorry about that. You've got to wake up when I get it back to you. Amen? <laughs> and so now, and so what we do is we go we over there, and we, uh, I was sitting down, and he says, in first place, and the first place person, he raised her hand. First place person stood up. He says, and it came to the front. He gave them the Bible. He says, Brother Domley, in the past six months, they memorized 392 verses in the past six months. Amen. I figured they probably don't work. <laughs> I know the United States don't get someone to memorize 392 verses in six months. He says in second place, he calls their name, they stand up. In second place, 220-something verses, second place. I think, well, they, he probably, they probably don't work either. He starts going down the list. I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to find out where in this list I would fall. I wasn't in first. I wasn't in second. I wasn't in third. He began to go down the list. Keep on going down the list. I'm starting to feel kind of squirmy, you know, like some of you are right now, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I was kind of starting to feel a little bit squirmy there in the seat, especially like Brother Danny's right now, you know. <laughs> His wife knows all She gave me a whole list on him this week. And so, and so, boy, I, I, and finally he gets down to last place. I'm thinking, certainly I can beat the last place person. He says in last place in the past six months, they memorized 27 verses in the past six months. I begin to think to myself, what a shame. I come here to bless these people. If they have given an altar call, I'll be the first one at the altar right now. So I knew I hadn't memorized that many scriptures in the past six months. But you know, when the Bible was exciting, we used to do that. Amen. When the Bible was exciting to us, and it was new to us, it didn't bother us to memorize scripture every month. We didn't, it didn't take much time. We didn't, we didn't give all these excuses. Wait, no, I'm getting old and see now. And I just can't memorize like I used to. I find out we can memorize all the scores and all the box scores in the sports page, but we can't memorize the Bible. You know what I'm saying? God's word. There used to be a time you couldn't, you couldn't, you used to enjoy here going so winning. Rain or shine, you'd go so winning. Didn't matter if your two hairs got messed up like Brother Lynn's and mine did today. Didn't matter about that. He's got two and I've got one. Amen. Of course, he's got a hairpiece, I'm sure. But you know, it didn't matter back then. When you first started going to Sony, you first met that first person in Christ, you know what I'm talking about. It was fun, wasn't it? 
That first person got saved, and boy, I mean, the head, the, you, know, you can hear the bells of heaven ringing. Say, boy, this is good. This is exciting. You go, so many you say, preacher, when can we go? He said, when we go. I mean, and if you, know, if you live back east, you know what I'm talking about? It didn't matter whether there's snow on the ground or not, son. You still go so many. Why? Well, it was fun. He was excited. He said, boy, I love going so many. This is the best thing in the world other than my salvation is going and so with somebody else. How did we say, boy, that's time? There used to be a time you enjoyed teaching your Sunday school class. There used to be a time you enjoyed visiting your bus route. There used to be a time you, would go, you enjoyed singing in the choir. There used to be a time you used to, you used to enjoy, um, you used to love your pastor. Remember when you first came here to this church and you heard him preach? There wasn't anyone else that compared to him. He was the best preacher in the world. I mean, you heard him preach and men. You know what? He's a pretty good preacher. I haven't heard a man preach like that in a long time. You got in that, you got in this church that man, I don't know another church around. You wasn't looking for churches back then like you might be doing right now. You just, you just realized he was God's man. You realized, man, he had God's message and every time he preached, he's not, it was like he was the one jumping down your throat and you come back Sunday night for more. Amen. You come in, you say, preacher, Oh, you ripped my face off this morning. Do it again tonight. <laughs> but my dad hasn't done that all week with me yet. <laughs> of course, you got to have a face to rip off first, amen? But anyway, I mean, so anyway, here you are. And boy, it was exciting to you. It was fun. You sat down that, you sat down that chair, and that preacher stood up, and it was like somebody gave him a list of what you did that week. He starts, he stood up and preached, I mean, and he do with a smile on his face. Like he enjoyed it. You think, where in the world is this guy come and joy and step put on my feet? But you sit there and say, boy, that's it, preacher. Preach it harder, harder, amen, preacher. You go down to the altar, you get down to the altar, come back seven nights, and then, preacher, that was this morning, just do it again tonight, just on little bit harder. Right. Amen. Amen. out of this altar. Tears begin to stream down your face. After the Holy Spirit has already dealt with your heart, you kneel down at this altar. There's tears that begin to roll down your face to get right with God. And oh, how sweet, how precious this altar was. But something's happened. Now, you've been around for a while. Now, you've heard sermon after sermon. And now as you've heard sermon after sermon, you've got weary with doing good. What do you mean? Remember when you first got saved? Preacher would say, you use the most exciting person around. It's kind of like a nut, like Brother Mike over here. <laughs> you'd sit there and you'd say amen like he'd say amen, like a nut. And boy, you say, boy, I mean, that, and you, you enjoyed talking about your salvation. Preacher would say, boy, my sins are gone. He'd say, well, glory to God. He'd say, well, my blood has covered my sins. He said, praise the Lord. 
He'd start preaching some more. He'd get so good, he'd start talking about salvation. You'd say, well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Why? It was fun. It was exciting. Preacher stand up saying, I got a testimony today. You the first one pop up your hand. You stand up and say, hey, let me tell you. Hey, I'm so glad I'm saved today. Hey, I remember the day. I remember, I remember how I was when I was lost. But now I'm saved for because Jesus, he, he took my feet and he picked me up out of the barley clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He established my holies. He has put a new song in my mouth. Even praise me. So see and fear and trust in the Lord. You begin to go around and see. Happy day, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away, he taught me how to watch and pray. And the rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away. And for your salvation got excited. Boy, it was good. You said, boy, I love my it's my salvation. Boy, it's good. Boy, it's exciting. You love it. Why? Because you knew you your salvation. You knew that one day you was lost. You was bound for hell. You got saved. You said, well, I do it in You take your shoes off, pick your hands and now This is God. Why? Salvation is fun. Right now, you've heard about salvation so many times. Now it doesn't seem exciting anymore. Now it's not exciting that you're once bound for hell. Now you're going to heaven. Now it's not exciting anymore. Why? You've got weary with it. Got weary with it. I was in a church not long ago. Preacher said, Brother Tommy, he says, You never believe that someone just left my church over. I said, What? So they got tired of me preaching on salvation. That's a mess. Got weary with their salvation. You got weary with listening to the preacher. You got weary with listening to the goodness and blessings of God. You got weary with God's will for your life. I mean, you got weary. As a preacher, it's so easy. You preach sermon after sermon after sermon, and now it gets so easy where now it just becomes a ritual, come become a habit. Or even as a Sunday school teacher, or as a bus worker, or as a junior church teacher, or whatever you do in this church, God's will for your life, and God's will for sermoning for your life, boy, it's not like it used to. Why? You got weary with it, and now it's not exciting. You still do it. But the fun and the excitement out there like it used to be. So this is what you've done. You've looked at Egypt. Oh boy, it was fun down there. And now, instead of getting excited over serving God in Bethel, instead of getting excited over souls getting saved like you used to, instead of getting excited over the preaching, no, we read the Bible and over prayer. Now your excitement comes from Egypt. You say, what do you mean? Now your excitement comes from sports. Now instead of shouting in the service, you shout when your team is winning. Hello, help me out now. Now, when your team's losing, you get angry. But before you used to get angry over sin, now you get angry when your team begins to lose. You get more emotional over over the over, over all of meeting Alabama. Because if you, you ought to be. Hey, no one ought to be Alabama. I don't care what you say. But anyway. <laughs> but I mean you you say, boy. And you, all your excitement, you look at the sports world, and your life is wrapped around sports. Now you get more excited over the sports and what you do over serving God. Hey, Hold on a second. Don't get your excitement from me. Just get your excitement from God. Amen. Amen. Now, our excitement, instead of coming from, the, from, from Bethel, now instead of that, we get our excitement from amusements. We like going to those amusement parks in Great America, Disneyland, and Knott's Berry Farm. We like getting on those roller coasters. I remember I was on this one roller coaster. Knott's Berry Farm. I went there with my husband, with my honey, and my wife. She goes, you can go. I'm staying down here. She was the smart one. I was the dumb one. We got on this roller coaster. I'm sitting right next to this guy. We start backing up, and I'm looking down and saying, whoa. <laughs> he says, what? what? How, how in the world did we get in here? I said, I don't know. But I said, I don't think we're going to get it out of this one too easy. But now we get more excited over doing, getting on that roller coaster and, and watching our luck come up. Amen? <laughs> we get more excited. Oh, we're going to, we, we, you young people know what I'm talking about. You are excited over going to those things and going round and round and round and round. Walking out, whoa, where am I? <laughs> you are excited over getting on that thing called the edge. That's dumb. 
Feel the edge. He go up slowly, move over, and he look down, and he realize all the way down is down. <laughs> and that's what you do. All you drop, and you gotta wait five minutes for your stomach to come and catch up to you. <laughs> <laughs> now we get more excited over that than what we do over church. Now, we get more excited over fellowships and recreations and what we do over church. Now, we get more excited and more emotional over movies and what we do over someone being lost and going to hell. So what are you talking about? I remember when I was a young boy. I'd be sitting watching a movie with my family. My older sister, Melody, began to start crying. I said, what's the matter, Melody? Oh, the thing's sad. I said, the movie. She goes, but they're going to die. I said, it's a movie. I said, let them croak, son. You know, I was boys. I was made them real emotional. They were the dumbest thing in the world to cry over a dumb movie. Them ladies, though, man, they can get emotional over a little dog, you know, getting sick or something like that, you know. They look at that movie, they go, oh, oh, and they start wiping. I, hold up, hold on a second now. Before, we used to get emotional over church. Now, we get emotional over movies. Before, we used to get emotional over church. Now, we get emotional over getting a new car. Instead of coming to church telling people how many people got saved, you come to church and say, hey, I bought a new car this week. And look, I'm looking at my car. You think everybody after your car, you got all those gifts most weeks like a rocket you're about ready to take off. And now, and you look and say, man, let me show what this button is. Don't pass that one over there and get ejected. You start passing, you thought you could hold these buttons all around. Huh? Say, man, I didn't mean, this and like this. Look at this car. You get excited over the new cars and not over church. Amen. Now you get excited over a new home. You look at this home, you drive by, and your wife says, Honey, I hate that. <laughs> honey, look at that. Can't you just imagine us in there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Too expensive. <laughs> That's the same reason you yield to the devil. I mean, to, to your wife. <laughs> Sorry, honey. I'm in trouble. I need another place to stay tonight, man. <laughs> you yield. You yield to your wife. I love you, honey. Amen. <laughs> you yield to your wife. I gotta go over here. She's sitting down right now. But you yield to your wife. You go look at that dumb thing. Before long, we're signing your name on that dumb line. And when I see your pants and all, this is wonderful, honey. She kisses you all over and says, Whoa, boy, did I do a good job. <laughs> you begin to tell her, Hey, come to class. You have all the barbecue, all the men over for barbecue because you want them to see your new home. You say, Man, this is, this is not just this is not just two stories. This is like one of them split three stories. He's like the preacher guy. <laughs> I mean, man, this is fun. This is neat. Look at my backyard. I like the preacher's backyard. It's pretty neat. I'm glad he has it, not me. My, my idea of a yard is cement, eh, man? Look at him. Hey, you're a good Christian, eh, man? Hey, so. Hey, so. I mean, man, I mean, he's in the backyard. Look at them kind of backyard. Oh, look at this thing. This thing's fun. Look at that. You show everybody your home. But boy, you get more excited over your home than what you do over the Son of God, over the page, and over the Holy Spirit. Well, you get more excited over money. Now you win $10 million, and everybody knows it. And before, really, money didn't mean much to you. Before, getting a raise just really wasn't part of your mind. Before, trying to, trying to set all this money up for everything else, instead of trying to get to missions and trying to get to the church, hey, it used to be fun in your head. Now you say, oh, I'm going to cut back to that. I'm not going to have retirement if I keep on giving to the church. So you cut back and give it to the church, start putting your retirement, start out and God takes out retirement. But making money is more about quiet on that one. Amen. Got a real quiet. I can stop there, son. Don't get quiet on me. <laughs> you see, we've got more excited over Egypt than what we have over Bethel. You ladies now, husbands gives you a hundred dollars. My wife didn't wait for me to do that. <laughs> your what your husband give you a hundred dollars, so just go to the mall and shop. She's, she's definitely praying that I'll do that one of these days. When I'm, when I'm rich, honey, I'll do it. Amen? So I don't have to worry about anything. 
And so, you ladies send them the mail. $100 to spend on the mail. Glory to God, I must be in heaven. You go to the mall, and man, it's like, it's like, oh, I've never seen a place like this before in my life. You drive by those factory outlet stores, you look at this, whoo, honey, they've got to have good deals in it. Look at factory outlets. No middleman. <laughs> you men know where I'm coming from. You, you ladies are hating me right now. But these ladies get right with God someday, man. I'll pick whether they like it or not. Hold on a second now. Now the ladies get more excited over these factory outlets and what they do over serving God. Now, hold on a second. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it is this. We still go to church. We still go soul winning. We still read our Bible. We still pray. We still do the things we used to do, but now we're more excited over Egypt than what we are over the world. And while we're more excited over over Egypt than what we are or, or, over, over, over Egypt than what we are over Bethel, what happens is this: there's a lot following us. Lot is watching us, and Lot sees how we get more excited over the Cowboys beating the Forty Niners the way it ought to have been, but the Cowboys beating the Forty Niners than what we do over people getting saved and getting baptized. Children grow up. They come to the age where now they can leave home. They began to investigate mom and dad's life, and they say, you know, mom and dad was never excited about serving God. They got more excited over the things of Egypt, even though they didn't live in Egypt. They got more excited over the things of Egypt than what they did over the things of God. And so because of that, the children go to Egypt because they've never experienced the heartaches of Egypt. Why? Mom and Dad got excited over Egypt, not over God. Now, how can we get out of this? How can we get back to Bethel? Number one, go back to the altar. Amen. Why don't you come back to this altar? Come back. Come down here. And get broken again. I mean, why don't you begin to cry and weep over, over your state of serving God like you used to? Why don't you look at yourself and see what you really are? Why don't you look at yourself and as you look at God, you see your righteousness is that stuff you had. Like that old rag that the leper, when they'd hang that rag on a little pole, the leper would go over to that little pole. To get that rag and just wipe that old pus from that leprosy on that little rag. That old pussy rag, God says, that's what our righteousness is like. Why don't we look at ourselves and see that our righteousness really isn't that much? Why don't we come down to this altar and realize we serve a holy God and say, oh God, oh God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for messing things up. I'm sorry, oh God. I haven't done the thing that I'm supposed to do. And God, my goodness, old lady has been rotten. I've done it out of soul. I've done it just for, for me so others can think I'm a good person. Oh God, I'm sorry. How do we get back to this altar tonight and get broken? Why don't we come back to the altar tonight? And just say, God, I'm not leaving this place till I'm not with you. I'm not leaving this place till I get that same fire back that I used to have. How do we get back to Bethel? Number one, get back to the altar. Number two, count your blessings. Amen. Count your blessings. You know why Bethel doesn't seem exciting to some of us? I'll tell you why. We haven't sat down and counted our blessings lately. We begin to sit down and count our blessings, and Bethel sure does seem pretty good. Amen. We sit down and we look at what God's done for us, and so if, even if you're not a, an emotional type, you begin to count your blessings, you become the emotional type. Amen. I like the song that says, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you 
what the Lord has done. Amen. You begin to sit down and say, Boy, God, it's good for me to look what I've got. I've got clothes on my back. Amen. I've got shoes on my feet. I've got hair on my head. He can't say that, and neither can I, but we at least got some on the side of our head. Amen. We got hair on our head. We've got eyes that see. Amen. We've got ears that hear. We've got feet that walk. We've got, we've got blood that's not paid by disease. We don't have leukemia. We don't have cancer. We don't have diabetes. We don't have all these diseases that come to our body and afflict us. We don't have Parkinson's disease. We don't have them. We don't have our brains. Oh, God, be good to me. Look at my body. God bless me. You begin to look at your flesh and say, Oh, God, be good to me. He's giving me a roof over my head, giving me a car to drive, giving me a church to go to, giving me a family that loves me. God brings it to me. You yeah. begin to sit down and count your blessings. All of a sudden you begin to sing praise God for all our blessings flow. Yeah. You begin to sing praise Him. Praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth is wonderful, I proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him. Highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guide his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, all of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. You begin to look at the blessings that it just begins to overflow in your heart. As you realize you've been able to walk on feet and not have to sit in a wheelchair, you begin to realize how good God's been to you. He's given you children that are healthy instead of children that are diseased and dying and laying in a hospital bed. You look at God and you say, Boy, God's been good to me. I was out at the park last week and I began to look at what all God's done to me. I began to think of those who've been sick and as I, as I talked to different people, I thought of one lady, I thought of one lady who's a little child, and, uh, a husband and a wife, who's a little baby, has a, has a tumor in her brain, they're not sure if it's going to live. I began to think about, about another woman who was in that same hospital, whose child was born a vegetable, 12 years old at the size of a little baby. I began to think about a father who diagnosed the tumor. They think he's cured now, but you never know. I began to think about a, a wife who lost her husband and her daughter to the train accident. I, be, I began to think, well, oh, God's done to you. All you can do is look up the God and say, oh, God, you've been so good to me. You've blessed me so much. I could hope Charles Weigel would sing. I would like to tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me. Like Jesus, there's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. You begin to think of how he wrote that song. After his wife gave him the ultimatum, honey, it's either God or me. He looked at his wife and says, Honey, I choose God. Amen. His wife left him. He said he was sitting in a little room. He began to think how God had been so good to him. And he wrote that great song. You begin to count your blessings and Bethel sure does seem pretty good. Amen. How do we get back to Bethel? I'll tell you how you get back to Bethel. Do the things you used to do. See what do you mean? If you used to go soul winning, go soul winning. 
Even if you didn't go to school, I wouldn't go to school with him. If you used to work on a bus route, go work on a bus route. If you used to help in a Sunday school class, go help in a Sunday school class. But whatever it was, when you used to be excited about serving God, go back to doing it. Why? Because that's where you lost it. The things that made you excited, you stopped doing. And now, you sit there. Like, so, like what some of you do tonight. I wonder... I can't wait till this week is over so I can get back to my normal routine. Why don't we tonight just go back to Bethel? Amen. Look at all these children. They're watching someone tonight. They see you get more excited over Egypt than what you do over Bethel. You mark my word, they'll go to, they'll go to Egypt instead of Bethel. And we'll say, oh, why did they turn out like that? I can tell you why. Someone loved Egypt more than they did Bethel. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. Oh, God, help us to look at our lives. May we be honest with ourselves and find out what we're more excited over. And may we say tonight, and be honest with thee, if we're, if we're not getting our excitement from Bethel, may we come down at this altar and just kneel down and say, Oh, God, I want to come back to thee. I want to come home to Bethel. Heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around. I ask this question tonight. I wonder who in here tonight would say, for the Dom Lane, I need that message tonight. That was for me. I want you to pray for me. Would you just slip up your hands? Just raise them up high. I see these hands. I see them all over. Many hands are raised. You can put them down. Who else is it? Brother Domley, I'll be honest with you. That message was for me. I needed that tonight. I see these hands. I see that one. These in the back. I see that one in the back. This one up front. This one over here on the side. I see that one. I see this one right here. Someone else. Brother Domley, that message was for me. I need to come back. I see this one over here on the side. I see that one right there. Let me ask you this question tonight. Who in here tonight said, Brother Dalman, I'll, be, I'll just be quite honest with you. I'm not even sure that I'm saved. I don't know if I'd go to heaven if I died. I don't want to go to hell. I'd like to go to heaven. But to be honest with you, Brother Dalman, I can't ever say I've, ever, I've even been at Bethel because I'm not even saved yet. Brother Dalman, I'd like to know if I die tonight and go to heaven. I have some doubts about it. But I'd like to get saved tonight. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. If someone could show me, I'd sure like to know how I could make it there. Brother Donald, please pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. If you're like that tonight, would you slip up your hand? Just raise it up high. I want to see your hands. I see this one right here. You can put it down. Anyone else? I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure if I die tonight, I'd go to heaven. But I want you to pray for me. Is there anyone else? I'm not sure that I'm saved. If you raised your hand tonight and said, I'm not sure that I'm saved, the preacher's going to be at the front. When we give the invitation time, if you raise your hand, I want you to come take the preacher's hand and say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I want to make sure of it tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you're saved, but God spoke to your heart. I want to point to the pianist. I want to ask the pianist if she can play Come Home. She's going to play the invitation song. And as she does, why don't you come home to Bethel tonight? Just come back to the altar tonight and say, God... It's about time I come home tonight. I want to get right. I want to get back to Bethel. I want to get my excitement back here. Father, you saw the hands that were raised. Oh, God, tonight, help us, Holy Spirit. Please, dear God, those who are saved, may they come home tonight to Bethel. May they just get right with thee tonight and get their excitement back. Please, dear God, help us to get it back. For this one who raised your hand that they're lost, I pray tonight they'd come forward tonight and get saved. God, speak to the hearts of thy people, I pray. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. Everyone standing to their feet. I want to point to the pen as she's going to begin to play. There's not going to be any singing. When I point to her, she's going to begin to play. Whatever you raise your hand for, that very first note... 
You step out and come down to this altar. Just get as close to the altar as you can. And just do some business with God as she begins to play. You come. Come on. Come on. Come on. You're not sure that you're saved tonight? You say, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'm not sure I go to heaven. Come take this man's hand right here and say, I want to know I can go to heaven. Can you show me? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on.